Section 1 of Instructions to Lightkeepers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. Instructions to Lightkeepers by the United States Lighthouse Board. Section 1. Notice. Office of the Lighthouse Board, Washington, D.C., July 1, 1881. The following instructions are published for the guidance of lightkeepers. They are required to read them carefully and attentively, and to refer to them whenever they are in any doubt in regard to their duties or the manner of performing them. Each keeper and assistant keeper will be furnished with a copy to be kept and used at the light stations where they are employed, to be handed over to their successors when they are relieved or discharged, or left at the light stations in case there should be no successors. Each light vessel keeper will be provided with two copies, for the use of himself and those of the crew who are charged with the management of and attendance upon the lights and fog signals. By order of the Lighthouse Board, John Rogers, Rear Admiral, USN, Chairman. Note. These pages are excerpted from the 1881 Instructions to Lightkeepers, using a copy of the original publication from the U.S. Coast Guard Historian's Office in Washington, D.C. Not all pages, specifically the salary tables and plates, were included in this version. Treasury Department, Document Number 151, Lighthouse Board, General Instructions to All Lightkeepers. 1. The keeper is responsible for the care and management of the light, and for the station in general. He must enforce a careful attention to duty on the part of his assistants, and the assistants are strictly enjoined to render prompt obedience to his lawful orders. 2. In the absence of the keeper, his duties will devolve upon the assistant present who is next in rank. No keeper shall leave his station without informing the assistant present who is next in rank of his intention, and of the probable length of his absence, and no assistant shall leave without the previous knowledge and consent of the keeper. But this regulation will not justify the keeper in denying an assistant any proper leave of absence. 3. An accurate report of absences, with the reasons therefor, must be forwarded monthly to the inspector by the keeper. 4. Watches must be kept at all stations where there is an assistant. The keeper on watch must remain in the watch room and give continuous attention to the light while he is on duty. When there is no assistant, the keeper must visit the light at least twice during the night between 8 p.m. and sunrise, and on stormy nights the light must be constantly looked after. 5. No keeper can excuse an assistant from his regular share of duty, except on account of disability. When such disability continues, immediate report thereof must be made to the inspector. 6. Light keepers may leave their stations to attend divine worship on Sundays, to procure needed supplies, and on important public occasions. As no specific rules can be established limiting the times and durations of absences, keepers will be held to strict account for any abuse of privileges. 7. In case of sickness, keepers must provide efficient attendance for the lights. But when a keeper is, or is likely to become, incapable of duty, the inspector must be informed at once of the need for assistance. 8. All keepers must acquaint themselves with the workings of the apparatus in their charge. Upon any doubtful point, questions must be asked. When the station is visited by an officer or employee of the lighthouse establishment, especially while the machinist or lampist is there, the keepers must take pains to acquire knowledge of every detail regarding the mechanism of the apparatus. 
ignorance upon any point will not be considered as an excuse for neglect of duty. 9. The keeper is responsible for the careful management and expenditure of stores and supplies. He must practice the strictest economy compatible with maintaining at all times the best possible light, and he must be careful to prevent waste, theft, and misapplication of lighthouse property. 10. Keepers having assistants will, in the presence of an assistant, attend personally to the daily issues. Keepers who have no assistants are required to take from the storerooms daily the necessary articles and quantities of supplies for that day's use. At the time of doing so, they must enter them correctly in the expenditure book. The exact quantity taken at the time must be entered, and not the average of each day's use. 11. A lighthouse must never be left wholly unattended. Where there is a keeper and one or more assistants, either the keeper or one of the assistants must be present. If there is only one keeper, some member of his family or other responsible person must be at the station in his absence. 12. Where there are assistants, the watches must be divided so that an equal share of work shall fall to each keeper. A watch book must be kept and signed by each person when he comes off watch. He must record in the book the condition of the light and the hour when he left the watch room. If there is a fog signal at the station and it is in operation, he should also so state and specify its condition. 13. The keeper shall take an equal share in all the work and duties of the station with the assistant keepers. 14. When a keeper neglects his duties, it is the imperative duty of each assistant at the station to report the facts without delay to the inspector. The reported keeper must be informed of the complaints made against him, so that he may, if he sees fit, transmit a statement to the inspector with the report. 15. Light keepers must not engage in any traffic on lighthouse premises, and they must not permit it by anyone else. They must not carry on any business or trade elsewhere which will cause them to be often absent from the premises, or to neglect in any way their proper duties. 16. Keepers must be courteous and polite to all visitors who conform to the regulations, and show them everything of interest about the station, at such times as it will not interfere with their lighthouse duties. Keepers must not allow visitors to handle the apparatus, or deface lighthouse property. Special care must be taken to prevent the scratching of names and initials on the glass of the lanterns, or on the windows of the towers. No visitor should be admitted to the tower unless attended by a keeper. 17. Keepers must under no circumstances allow an intoxicated person to enter a light tower, nor to remain on the premises longer than is necessary to get him away by the employment of all proper and reasonable means. 18. Keepers must not make any charge nor receive any fee for admitting visitors to lighthouses. 19. Keepers must render every assistance in their power to laborers employed in making repairs or alterations at light stations. In all cases where keepers are able to make repairs, they are expected to do the work themselves. All the mechanical skill of a keeper should be exercised in keeping his station in good order. 20. Keepers must make no change in the colors of towers or buildings without written orders. 21. The utmost neatness of buildings and premises is demanded. Bedrooms, as well as other parts of the dwelling, must be neatly kept. Untidiness will be strongly reprehended, and its continuance will subject a keeper to dismissal. 22. Only members of keepers' families may reside at light stations. The lighthouse board alone can grant any exception to this rule. 23. 
keepers must report promptly to the inspector, on the proper form, all wrecks which take place in the vicinity of their stations, all the facts relating to the wreck, whether or not the light was seen, and etc., must be ascertained, and the account embodied in the report. It is the duty of light keepers to aid wrecked persons as far as lies in their power. 24. Every precaution must be taken against fire. Fire buckets, when provided, must be kept filled with water and ready for use in a fixed place. In case of the ignition of mineral oil, it can be better extinguished with sand or ashes than with water. 25. Fires and lights in keepers' dwellings must never be left unattended. 26. Boats are furnished to light stations where they are necessary for communication with the mainland, to obtain household supplies, etc., or they are supplied that keepers may perform their public duties properly. They are not provided for personal benefit and convenience. Keepers are forbidden to use boats thus placed in their charge for any other than lighthouse purposes. The boats must not be used for freighting, wrecking, fishing with seines, ferrying, or for carrying goods or passengers for hire. Keepers must make good all damages to boats or their equipments caused by their carelessness or neglect. 27. When a keeper resigns or is removed, a correct inventory of all public property under his charge must be made in the presence of his successor. Three copies of this inventory must be made, and signed by his successor. One is to be retained by him, one is to be kept by the retiring keeper, and the third is to be transmitted by him to the inspector. On the death of a keeper, his widow, or whoever has been left in charge of the light, must turn over the public property to the new keeper, as above required. 28. No keeper who resigns or is removed, and no representative of such keeper, shall receive any balance on account of salary, until he shall have accounted satisfactorily for all public property in his charge. 29. No keeper should sign receipts upon entering on his duties, or at any other time, for any supplies, until he is satisfied that the articles and quantities are correctly stated. Keepers will be held pecuniarily responsible for all which they receipt. 30. Condemned articles, and articles no longer of use at light stations, must be delivered to the master of the supply vessel. Keepers must obtain duplicate receipts for these articles, retain one, and forward the other to the inspector. 31. Monthly or special reports of the condition of a light station must state explicitly what is wanted in case any repairs or changes are needed. All measurements, estimates, etc., must be given so fully that the inspector or engineer will not have to write for further information. Failure to do this has caused much inconvenience and delay. 32. Keepers of stations situated where navigation is closed by ice in winter will exhibit their lights so long as any vessel is running in that vicinity. Lights may be extinguished when navigation is entirely suspended, but must always be shown if it is at all possible for vessels to benefit by them. Report must be made to the inspector of the time of discontinuance and also of the time of relighting. 33. Keepers at island stations on the northern lakes must be governed in exhibiting their lights by the action of those on the mainland. Those who cannot reside at their stations during the winter, or who are permitted to be absent by special authority, must continue their lights as long as possible in the fall, without endangering their lives by being caught in the ice and must return to their stations as early in the spring as the ice will permit. End of section 1 
Section 2 of Instructions to Lightkeepers by the United States Lighthouse Board. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Care of Lights and Their Appurtenances 34. Lights must be lighted punctually at sunset, and must be kept burning at full intensity until sunrise. 35. All preparations must be made early, that there may be no delay in lighting. 36. When the light is extinguished in the morning, the keeper must hang the lantern curtains and immediately begin to put the apparatus in order for relighting. While doing this, the linen aprons provided for the keeper's use must be worn, that the lens may not suffer from contact with the wearing apparel. The illuminating apparatus must be carefully covered before the cleaning is begun. 37. The lens and the glass of the lantern must be cleaned daily, and always kept in the best possible condition. Before beginning to clean the lens, it must be brushed with the feather brush to remove all dust. It must then be wiped with a soft linen cloth, and finally polished with buff skin. If there is oil or grease on any part, it must be taken off with a linen cloth, moistened with spirits of wine, and then polished with a buff skin. Under no circumstances must a skin which has been wet or damp be used, as this will scratch the lens. 38. Rouge must be used for polishing the lens whenever necessary. When it is used, it should be broken up put in water, and reduced to a smooth mixture. To do this, the rouge should be put into about a pint of water, and stirred with a perfectly clean stick. Let it rest for a few moments, to allow any gritty particles it may contain to settle, then pour it off into another vessel, allowing the grit to remain in the first. Then leave it to settle for about a half an hour, and then pour off the water. The rouge, so prepared, must be spread with a camel's hair brush, or a piece of soft linen, over the entire surface of the glass to be cleaned. When this coating of rouge has become dry, rub it off with a piece of buff skin until it is all removed. Rouge must be freshly prepared each time it is used. 39. Whiting is prepared and used in the same manner as rouge. 40. To use rotten stone for polishing brass work, pulverize it carefully in a tin pan, and mix it with water or oil until it becomes a thin paste. Use it with a woolen cloth, free from dust or grit. After rubbing with the rotten stone, finish with whiting, using a soft clean rag. 41. To clean reflectors, first dust them, and then rub with a buff skin, lightly dusted with rouge powder, kept in a small double bag of muslin, then rub lightly with another skin, and finally with a third, which should be passed over the reflector in a light, quick manner, with a circular motion. Leakage of gas from the pipe of the stove used in the watch-room should be carefully guarded against, as this gas will badly tarnish a reflector. Silver-plated reflectors are much more easily injured than glass, and require great care. 42. To clean the chimneys, they must, if soiled by smoke or oil, be rubbed with a rag or a small piece of soft wood dipped in oil, then wiped off and cleaned with whiting. If this does not remove discolorations, they should be rubbed with a wet cloth and a little soda or common salt but they must be washed in warm water afterwards, as any adhering salt will cause breakage. 43. Keepers are forbidden to use any other materials for cleaning or polishing than those supplied by the lighthouse establishment. 44. Keepers are forbidden to clean the floors of the lanterns or the stairs and floors of the towers with any material by which dust may be produced. All materials used must be damp, and be carefully removed before they are dry. All sweeping must be done with care, and chiefly with hand-brushes. 
45. Utensils of all kinds must be kept in their proper places. While the light is burning, everything which does not belong in the lantern must be removed from it. 46. The revolving clockwork must be kept carefully from dust. It must be oiled with clock oil whenever necessary, care being taken to remove any old and gummy oil before new oil is applied. All parts made of iron or steel must be rubbed with a cloth greased with tallow, the use of salted grease is forbidden. The foot of the fly shaft must be examined occasionally to see that it is not cutting or wearing. 47. The chariot or carriage upon which the lens revolves must be carefully wiped and the rollers kept properly oiled. If it is necessary to take off the rollers and clean them, this must be done with great care. The rollers must be removed one by one, and put back without changing the number of washers previously in use, as the carriage will turn irregularly if all the rollers are not exactly the same distance from the center. When there is any serious trouble with any part of the revolving clockwork or machinery, the inspector and engineer must be at once informed, and a machinist will be sent to remedy the difficulty. 48. When not in use, the weight must always be kept upon its rest, that the strain on the cord may be relieved. 49. Keepers must replace the broken glass of the lantern as quickly as possible. They must learn how to use the cutting diamond, so as to be able to cut the glass when necessary. When glass is cut, its edges should be ground level and smooth, by rubbing it upon a cast-iron plate covered with sharp wet sand. In placing the glass, about one-twelfth of an inch play should be left all around between it and the iron frame. If it touches the iron, great risk of its being broken by the oscillation of the lantern in high wind will be incurred. Thin cleats of lead or soft wood must be used to rest the glass upon when in place. In joining two pieces of glass, which rest one upon the other, the upper edge of the lower piece should be covered with putty, about two-tenths of an inch in thickness. On this two small strips of lead should be placed, upon which the upper pane should rest. The weight will press out any excess of putty, which excess should immediately be taken off with the glazing knife. The putty on the outside of the frame should be laid evenly and flush with the face of the sash. In replacing the outside slats of the sash, a small quantity of putty should be put over the head of each screw after it has been screwed home, as this will serve to keep the screw in place. 50. The following named returns must be made by keepers of lighthouses. The returns required from keepers of light vessels are given on page 16. Monthly. Report of condition of station, both to inspector and engineer. Fog signal report. Absence report. Quarterly. Expenditures of oil, etc. Vouchers for salary. Abstract of passing vessels. Annually property returns. When necessary, receipt for extra supplies, keeper's receipt for property on taking charge, receipt for delivery of supplies, shipwreck report, report of any damage to station or apparatus, this to be made both to the inspector and engineer, any unusual occurrence. The vouchers for salary must be sent so that they will arrive at the inspector's office at least a week before the end of the quarter. 51. The following books must be kept at all stations. Daily expenditure book, general account book, journal. A watch book must be kept also at all stations where there is more than one keeper, and a fog signal record where there is a fog signal. In keeping the journal, two pages, the right and the left, are to be used for one month. The events of the day must be written on one line across both pages. As a general rule, if carefully written, one line will be found sufficient. 
the visits of the inspector or engineer, or of the lampist or machinist, and an account of any work going on, or delivery of stores, must be noted, as also any item of interest occurring in the vicinity, such as the state of the weather and other similar matter. The books must be kept in ink, with neatness, and must always be kept up to date. Footnote. The following addendum was placed to face page 7 of Instructions to Light Keepers. End footnote. Salutes. Keepers of light stations and light vessels provided with bells will salute with three strokes of the bell lighthouse tenders upon their approach to and departure from such stations and vessels. The salute will be returned by the tender with three blasts of the whistle or by three strokes of the bell. In case of a passing tender, one salute, as above prescribed, will be given and returned. The salute will also be given to all vessels of the United States government, and to any vessel which is known by the keeper to have on board any person entitled to the courtesy of a salute. In case the bell has no inside clapper which can be rung by hand, the connecting rod to the machine should be detached before using the striker for salutes. INSTRUCTIONS FOR USE OF EIGHT-DAY LANTERNS Take off reservoir, turn it upside down, and fill it completely with oil. Put reservoir back, light the lamp, let it burn for half an hour, and see that it does not smoke. Once a week, put in a new wick, throw out oil in body of lamp, and rinse with a little fresh oil, put in a clean wire gauze strainer. To clean strainers, boil in concentrated lye. These lanterns will not go out in the wind, but are liable to be extinguished by a shock. So when the lantern is hung up, care should be taken that it cannot strike the support. When convenient, it is better to place the lantern on a shelf on top of a post. End of section 2 Section 3 of Instructions to Lighthouse Keepers by the United States Lighthouse Board. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Instructions to Keepers Using the Funk Lard Oil Float Lamp 52. Fill the upper reservoir, first closing the stopcock in the supply tube, then open the stopcock and allow the oil to completely saturate and overflow the wicks, after which close the stopcock until ready to light. 53. Before lighting, and after all connections are made, see that the burner is perfectly level and in the focus. This must be done carefully, as the screwing on of the supply tube is apt to throw the burner out of adjustment. Failure to level the burner is apt to cause breakage of chimneys, and the light will not burn so well when the oil is higher on one side of the burner than on the other. It is also absolutely necessary that the light should be in the focus, as if it is not so it cannot show well outside. Great care and attention must be given by keepers to these two essentials of a good light. 54. Keepers are forbidden to use anything but the lucernes or the small hand lamps in lighting the lamps, as if paper or matches are used, parts are liable to fall into the burner and retard the flow of oil. 55. When lighting up, light the inner wick of the burner first. Having the wick turned up about one-third of an inch, hold the lucernes at two opposite points, lighting the wick in two places at once. When the wick is burning all around, turn it down low and proceed to light the second wick, and so on until all the wicks are lighted. 56. After first lighting, the flame must be kept low, and the chimney above its proper position, so that it will be slowly heated. Turn the wicks up slowly, and gradually lower the chimney until the full height of the flame is reached. This ought to be at the end of half an hour, at which time the flame should show a height for a first-order lamp 
of from three and a half to three and three quarter inches, for a second order of from three to three and a quarter, for a third order of from two and a half to two and three quarters. See plate six. A gauge is furnished, showing about what this height should be. The wicks, when the light is at its full intensity, should be turned up until the flame can be raised no higher without smoking. 57. The flame must be throughout as white as possible. If it is of a reddish tint, it shows that the chimney is too high, or that the damper does not allow sufficient draft, or that the ventilation is not sufficient. If the chimney is too low, a white flame will be obtained, but the flame will not be high enough. When the wind is light, a portion of all the ventilators may be opened. If strong, only those to the leeward. They must be managed so that the light will burn clearly and steadily. 58. If a chimney breaks, turn down the light immediately and put on a spare one, four of which must always be on hand. 59. If the wicks need trimming, turn the light as low as possible, and trim them without removing the burner. In removing the chimney to do this, wrap it in the flannel cloth provided for the purpose, so that it will not cool too suddenly. 60. A spare burner must always be at hand, ready for use, in case one of the wicks gives out, or in case the service burner is in any way out of order. When it becomes necessary to replace the service burner, dip the spare burner in oil before putting it in place, so as to saturate the wicks, after which it may be adjusted. 61. If the oil does not flow freely, or if the supply is entirely cut off, it must in nearly all cases be from a stoppage in the float chamber. When this occurs, remove and clear the float chamber. An accident such as this, however, can scarcely happen with a careful keeper, as it can only occur when the apparatus is clogged with dirt. 62. In putting out the light at sunrise, care must be taken to prevent a sudden cooling of the lamp. Care must also be taken not to heat it too quickly on lighting. To put out the light, the wicks must be slowly turned down, beginning with the outer one. When the light is finally extinguished and the chimney after a time taken off, the chimney must be wrapped in the flannel cloth that it may cool slowly. 63. Once in six months, dismount the lamp and thoroughly overhaul it, putting the spare one in its place. Boil the burner and strainer in strong soap suds, then thoroughly wash all parts of the lamp, rinse them in clean hot water to remove the soap, putting the tubes and burner near a hot stove to dry out the moisture, wipe out the reservoir with a clean towel, examine the washers of the pump carefully. 64. Examine the float and float chamber once a week at least. Lint or woolen fiber is frequently found in the oil, which collects around the pin and clogs the passage of the oil. Nothing sharp or hard must be used to clean the valve seat. A piece of soft wood should be used for this purpose. 65. In placing the lamp, the cross threads provided for the purpose must be used to center the burner and to get it into focus. There is a small wooden gauge furnished, which fits in the center of the burner, the lower reservoir, the burner being in place, must be moved until the center of the gauge is just under the intersection of the cross threads and touching them. The spirit level must then be used to show that the burner is level, and the burner or reservoir must be moved or changed until the burner is exactly level, and the center of the wooden plug or gauge is at the proper point. The light will never show well unless it is properly leveled and focused. 66. Lard oil butts must be kept lightly covered, their gutters filled with oil, and their air cocks closed, or the oil will become rancid. A drip can must always be hung on the draw-off cock to catch all drippings. In drawing off the oil, 
First, turn the air cock to admit air, otherwise the oil will not flow. But the air cock must be closed again as soon as the drawing of the oil is finished. When a butt has been emptied, it must be thoroughly cleaned and washed out and wiped quite dry. The gutters must then be filled with oil and the cocks all closed. 67. The oil found in the lower reservoir, after the light has been put out in the morning, is to be drawn off as low as it will run through the cock, and any remaining oil must be taken up with a clean sponge or towel and squeezed into the oil carrier. To this oil add a sufficient quantity from the butt to refill the lamp. When ready to refill, the oil must be drawn into a clean carrier, and from thence poured into the reservoir. The actual quantities consumed must constitute the daily expenditures. No guessing or averaging will be permitted. 68. In cold weather, heat the oil before putting it in the reservoir. Its temperature should be raised to about 90 degrees or 100 degrees Fahrenheit, or until it is a shade too hot to bear to hold the hand in it. If too hot, it will injure the pump leathers. If it is unusually cold, the precaution may be taken of wrapping flannel about the float chamber, as it is there the oil is most likely to chill. 69. Oil which has any sediment in it must be put in a separate butt used to hold impure oil. From this butt must be taken all the oil used for house lamps. After the oil in this butt has well settled, the clear oil may be drawn off again and used in the lighthouse lamp. Instructions to Keepers Using the Funk Mineral Oil Float Lamp 70. Fill the reservoir until the oil is visible in the strainer through which it must be poured. When it is full, close the faucet and wind the plunger up to its full height. 71. Open the faucet about ten minutes before it is time to light the lamp. 72. To light the lamp, raise the damper tube, D, see plate 2, into the connecting tube, K, and let it rest on the locks, 19. Then raise the chimney holder close up to the surface of the burner. Immediately after lighting, adjust the chimney and the damper tube so as to prevent any smoke. The flame should be kept low at first, and the chimney high, so that the chimney may be slowly heated. Raise the wicks gradually, and lower the chimney, until the flame is at its best, which should be at the end of about half an hour. 72. The damper must be so managed that the flame will burn clear and at its full height and with no smoky points. This must have much and careful attention. 74. About ten minutes before sunrise, close the faucet, open the damper, and let the flame burn itself out. Then remove and wrap the chimney in flannel until it is entirely cooled. Then simply wipe the ash from the wick. No other trimming is required. With a goose feather or any feather sufficiently long, clean the whole length of the air spaces in the burner. 75. If it is necessary to remove and replace the burner during the night, remove the chimney, close the faucet 10, see plate 2, unscrew nut 9 and screws 15, then slide the burner forward to detach it from the float chamber connection. 76. To remove and replace the float, unscrew the cap 14 of the float chamber F, Take out the float support, 13, with the float. Hold the latter with one hand, and with the other unscrew steel pin 12, which will release the float. Before replacing the float, blow through the supply tube, G, and if it is not free from obstruction, it must be made so by washing in hot soap suds. The strainers must be cleaned with hot soap suds. In cleaning the valve seat, use a clean piece of soft wood. No wire or hard substance must be used. 77. In fitting the wicks, be careful to prevent them from extending below the rings. 
78. To take out the plunger, first dismount the burner and float chamber, take out small weights, remove the oil with the siphon, unfasten the screws which hold the top plate of the reservoir, then wind the crank until the plunger is at the upper end of the cylinder, when it is easily removed by taking hold of the bridge to which the chain is attached. Take out the small screw which holds the upper end of the chain, and let it slip through the top plate. 79. If new leather packing is required, take out the six small screws holding the leathers and the iron ring, four, then remove the first leather ring without disturbing the second one, which serves only as a protection to the outer one. In replacing, fix the leather so that the holes in it will fall exactly over the screw holes, then put on the iron ring and screw it down gradually all around so as to make a tight joint. 80. To put in a new valve leather, unscrew the top nut of the valve and take the old one out and replace it with a new one. 81. To replace the plunger, slip the tin ring over the plunger, partly covering the leather ring to prevent its spreading. Introduce the plunger, being careful to have the chain turned in the proper direction, and then remove the tin ring. Connect the supply tube, G, pull the plunger up by hand, and close the faucet. The compressed air will then hold the plunger up until the upper end of the chain can be secured in place. The small weights can be put in the plunger through the opening in the top plate. 82. Every precaution must be taken to keep the strainers in good order. Mineral oil always contains a quantity of lint and woolen fiber, which must be carefully kept from getting into any part of the lamp. 83. For care of mineral oil, see the following instructions. Instructions to keepers of fourth, fifth, and sixth order lights. 84. The lamps are of two kinds, viz. the Haines, or low reservoir, and the constant level lamps. The Haines lamp has the oil reservoir immediately below the burner, to the crest of which the oil is drawn by capillarity. It is in two parts, the base, or stand, and the oil bowl. The constant level lamp has the reservoir on one side of the burner, and is connected with it by means of a tube through which the oil passes. The lamps should be filled nearly but not quite to the top, a little room being left to allow for the expansion of the oil when heated. 85. The service lamp must be placed inside the lens in its place, and then lighted. The flame must be kept low for the first half hour, in order to avoid heating the chimney too rapidly. The wick, if turned up before the chimney and burner are somewhat heated, is liable to smoke. 86. The service lamp, when filled and ready for use in the evening, should, if the weather is very cold, be kept in a room of a moderate temperature, to prevent the chilling of the oil. 87. The flame is chiefly regulated by raising or lowering the chimney, this must be done until the best effect is obtained. The most useful portion of the flame is nearly all above the button. The position of the button must not be changed. When points or irregularities in the flame appear, they can sometimes be made to disappear by simply turning the chimney around its axis to a new position. 88. The Haines and flat wick lamps must be changed at midnight as when the oil burns low it does not give so good a light. The new lamp should be lighted before the other is removed. Constant level lamps do not need to be changed as a rule, as they will burn with undiminished brilliancy so long as there is any oil in them. 89. In extinguishing lamps at sunrise, turn the wick down slowly so as not to cool the chimney too suddenly. When very low, put it out by blowing across the top of the chimney. It is dangerous to blow down the chimney of a mineral oil lamp. When the chimney is taken off, keep it wrapped in flannel until cooled. 90. 
To trim the lamp, after blowing out the light, pour out any oil that may remain in the reservoir, then relight and let it burn out of itself, which it will do in about half an hour. Then simply rub off the light ash remaining on the wick. No other trimming is required. This is the only way to get a perfectly level wick. 91. Under no circumstances should oil be poured into a lamp while it is lighted, nor shall it be filled in the vicinity of any light or fire. 92. No smoking shall be allowed in the oil room, nor shall any uncovered light be taken there. In case the oil catches fire, it can be extinguished more easily with sand or ashes than with water. 93. The oil must be drawn only by daylight. Under no circumstances should it be drawn at night. The cans should be kept tightly closed, and the oil room cool and ventilated. The pargetized can is furnished to stations as a vessel of supply. The oil for filling the lamps and other daily service must be drawn from it. It must be filled from the transporting or store cans whenever necessary. 94. The boxes containing the transporting cans must always be kept right side up. Keepers must not put anything into empty cans. All empty cans must be turned in to the master of the supply vessel when she arrives, and a receipt taken, as prescribed in paragraph 108 of the regulations of the Lighthouse Board. End of section 3「Section 4 of Instructions to Lightkeepers by the United States Lighthouse Board. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Instructions to Keepers of Lightships 95. The keeper of a lightship is responsible for her efficiency in every regard. He must exact from every person on board, under his command, a strict and careful attention to duty, and must promptly report to the inspector any derelictions on the part of any of the crew. 96. A logbook must be kept in which all the duties of the vessel and occurrences of importance must be noted, stating the condition of the lights, the times at which it was necessary to trim them, etc., the length of time which intervened between the lowering and hoisting of the lantern, etc., the number of men on duty in each watch, the direction and strength of the wind, the state of the weather at 8 p.m., midnight, and 8 a.m., and during gales as much oftener as may be required to make a useful record, the times at which moorings were examined and their condition, the overhauling of the hold, and, in fact, every item of importance with relation to the ship's duties. This log must be copied from the slate into the book by the keeper or mate, and signed by the person in charge of the watch for the time being. 97. The keeper is responsible for the safety and good order of all stores, utensils, and apparatus of every description. He must observe the strictest economy compatible with showing the best light possible. 98. A keeper must, immediately after taking charge of a new light vessel or succeeding a former keeper, take an inventory of all anchors, cables, boats, stores, materials, and supplies of all kinds, a copy of which inventory, duly signed by him, he must transmit to the inspector. 99. The keeper must keep a daily account of all stores expended. At the end of each quarter he must send a copy of this account to the inspector, on the blanks furnished for the purpose, with such remarks from the log as are necessary to make a complete abstract of the weather and special occurrences during that time. 100. The keeper must attend at the receipt of all stores and give his assistance. He must satisfy himself as to the quantity and condition of the stores received. 
he must make a report of the quality of the stores in the quarterly report succeeding their receipt, or must make a special report earlier if circumstances render it necessary. 101. Keepers must frequently exercise the crews in the signals when any are placed on board. 102. Keepers and mates must make themselves thoroughly conversant with all nautical instruments and charts on board their vessels, and must be able at least to find the latitude by meridian observation of the sun. 103. In case of any wrecks taking place in the vicinity of a light ship, its keeper must, if possible, learn whether the light was seen by anyone on board the wrecked vessel, and whether it was recognized, and how long it was seen before the vessel struck. All other circumstances of interest must be embodied in the wreck report the keeper sends to the inspector. 104. A book containing an account of the vessels passing the light vessel must be kept, and an abstract showing the number of passing vessels in each quarter must be sent to the inspector. 105. The keeper must see that the watch is set and everything in order before leaving the deck at night. 106. A regular watch must be kept at all times. The pump well must be sounded at least once during any watch at night, and in bad weather every hour. In case the light ship makes more water than usual, the fact must be reported at once to the keeper. 107. Fire buckets must be kept on deck, in the most convenient place for use, and when the temperature will permit, filled with water at sunset every day. They are on no account to be kept between decks at night. 108. Every precaution must be taken against fire. No matches, lighted lamps, candles, or fires must be left unattended or in exposed places. 109. Two draw buckets must be kept properly strapped and fitted, one on each side, and the end of the bucket rope made fast to the vessel when there is no wash deck pump. 110. The wash deck pump must be examined frequently and kept in good order. 111. The lightning conductors, if fitted with outriggers and not let down to the copper, must be rigged out and led clear of everything, every day at sunset, and rigged in at daylight, excepting in bad weather, during the continuance of which they must be kept rigged out. 112. In bad weather the keeper must give constant personal attendance to the affairs of the ship. He must see the spare anchor kept ready for letting go, and a proper range of cable on deck, bitted and stoppered to bring the vessel up in case she drags, and a sufficient watch must be kept to meet any emergency. 113. The deep sea lead must be kept overboard in heavy weather, and a hand stationed by it whenever there is danger of the vessel dragging. Should she drag such a distance as to deceive passing vessels in regard to their position, the lights must be extinguished, and day marks carefully concealed. 114. Under no circumstances, except those of extreme and imminent danger, shall the lightkeeper permit the vessel to be moved from her proper station. 115. Every month the riding chain must be hove in, until the point where it is shackled to the bridle is above water. The chain must then be carefully examined, and its condition noted in the log. A report of any injury or bad condition must be made at once to the inspector. 116. Keepers must be careful to vary the scope of chain according to the weather. In mild, smooth weather, the chain must be hove in to a moderate scope. In heavy and tempestuous weather, and in gales, 
it must be veered to its full scope. 117. In case of heavy drift ice, keepers are recommended to shackle a shot of chain from the upper hawse pipe to the riding chain, and then veer until a part of the strain comes on this chain. The chain from the upper pipe serves to cut the ice before it masses against the ship's bows. 118. A report of the examination of moorings, and also a report of absences, must be transmitted at the end of each month to the inspector. 119. The ballast must be moved and the hold thoroughly cleaned out at least once in six months. 120. The ship must be pumped out daily. Any water which cannot be removed by the pumps must be bailed out with buckets and swabs. Every precaution must be taken to keep the vessel well ventilated. Wind sails must be kept up in summer. In hot weather, awnings must be spread to keep the vessel cool between decks. 121. Wet clothing or wet bedding must not be kept below. Once a week, all bedding must be carefully aired in summer, and at least once a month in winter. 122. During the stormy season, sails must be kept bent. They must be frequently loosed to dry when the weather will permit. 123. Great care must be taken of the boats and their equipments. 124. Prompt information must be sent to the inspector when there is danger that supplies or stores will run short. 125. The keeper is prohibited from carrying on any trade or business whatever which will take him from the light ship or in any way cause him to neglect his public duties. Nothing whatever shall be kept for sale on board the light ship. 126. No malt, vinous, or spirituous liquors must be kept or used on board of any light ship except those belonging to the medicine chest, which must be reserved for cases of actual illness. 127. The keeper must hail all vessels, which by hovering too near the light ship may prevent the lights from being seen, and request them to keep off. Under no circumstances shall he permit any vessel to make fast to the light ship. 128. Keepers shall not permit the vessels under their charge to be made a rendezvous for pilots. Every proper courtesy must be shown pilots, as well as all other persons, but no undue use of the light vessels or their boats shall be permitted to any one. 129. The keeper and mate are prohibited from being absent from the ship at the same time. One of the two must always be on board. 130. Crews of light ships will be allowed all reasonable and proper indulgences in visiting their friends and families ashore. During the milder seasons of the year, two of the crew, besides the keeper or mate, may be ashore at a time, if the ship carries a complement of eight persons all told. If but six persons or less are attached to the ship, only one beside the keeper or mate may be allowed to be absent. During the stormy seasons of the year, only one of the crew in either case shall be absent. And if the season is especially tempestuous, all hands must remain aboard as a rule, short absences only being allowed under such circumstances. Any abuse of these privileges on the part of any one must be promptly reported to the inspector by the keeper. 131. Keepers, mates, and crews are all required to live and mess on board the light ships to which they are attached. No rations or provisions purchased with commutation money for rations shall be taken out of the ship. 132. Commutation, 
not exceeding one-third of the whole number of rations allowed on board any light ship, may be permitted at the current contract price of the rations. Upon satisfactory assurances being given to the inspector that this commutation money will be used in purchasing fresh provisions or fruit for the use of the messes on board, and that the money shall not be applied to any other purpose. No division of this money will be allowed amongst the individuals of the crew to make separate purchases. This commutation is only permissory, and any failure to comply with these requirements will ensure the withdrawal of the permission and subject the keeper to dismissal. 133. For care of mineral oil, see pages 12 and 13, Instructions to Keepers of 4th, 5th, and 6th Order Lights. 134. The following returns shall be made by keepers of light vessels to the inspector. Monthly. Mooring reports. Fog signal reports. Quarterly. Expenditures of oil, etc. Muster roll report of absences, payroll, to be sent in fifteen days before end of quarter, abstract of passing vessels, annually, description and inventory of vessels, whenever necessary, shipping articles, shipwreck reports. End of section 4. Section 5 of Instructions to Lightkeepers by the United States Lighthouse Board. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Directions and Instructions for the Use and Management of Fog Signals 135. The keepers of stations provided with fog signals will be held to a strict accountability for the proper care, attention to, and management of fog signals. 136. The principal keeper of the light station must satisfy himself by a thorough, careful, personal examination and inspection of the engine, boiler, and the entire machinery of the fog signal before attempting to put it in operation, that it is in complete and satisfactory working order and when it is not in operation, all its parts must be dusted daily, and, if necessary, cleaned and wiped off. When the engine is not in operation, it must be covered with a tarpaulin or canvas cover to keep dust out of the journals and off of the friction surfaces. 137. In the event of accident to or derangement of any part of the machinery, unless the injury be of such a kind that the keeper is able to make the necessary repairs himself, it must be reported immediately to the lighthouse engineer or inspector of the district, accompanied by such detailed report as will enable the officer to whom the report is made to provide the necessary assistance and materials for putting the fog signal in efficient working order in the shortest time, Hand force pumps, with pipe connection cocks, etc., should be provided for every steam fog signal boiler. The engine room must be kept clean, the unpainted parts of the machinery kept free from dust, dirt, and rust, and the painted parts wiped dry at all times and well oiled. No dirty waste, cotton, or woolen rags, or cloths saturated with oil, are to be left in boxes, corners of the room, or elsewhere, where they might become ignited from spontaneous combustion. But when the wiping off of the engine and machinery has been finished, these articles are to be thrown into water in buckets for washing, or, if unfit for further use, to be thrown into the furnace of the boiler to be burned. 138. Whenever the apparatus is in operation, a keeper must be in the engine house, in charge, and awake. It will not answer to leave the machinery alone for a single moment. If it should be necessary for the keeper, immediately in charge, to quit the engine house, some competent person must temporarily relieve him. 139. 
Should the steam boiler have a beater attached to it for keeping the water in it warm preparatory to raising steam, fire should be made under it as soon as there is any indication of a necessity for using the fog signal, which fire must be contained with the draft so regulated as to raise the temperature of the water in the boiler from 190 degrees to 210 degrees Fahrenheit as speedily as possible. The water being at this temperature, fire should be cautiously made in the furnace as soon as it is seen that the fog signal will be required, and when there is sufficient steam for operating the fog signal effectively and continuously, according to its distinguishing character, it should be put in motion. The time, state of the weather, etc., should be duly noted. 140. Whenever the fire is allowed to go out, or is drawn from the boiler, the furnace and ash pit should be thoroughly cleaned, kindling wood placed in the furnace, and everything made ready for lighting when it shall be again needed. In starting the getting up steam in the boiler, the fire should be controlled to burn moderately and the safety valve kept open until the steam escapes freely when the valve may be closed and the fire permitted to burn to full activity 141 in cold weather with indications of fog or snow the water in the boiler should be kept at 190 to 210 degrees fahrenheit by the heater but great care must be taken in firing, not to force the heater so much as to run the risk of so rapidly evaporating the water as to burn it. 142. After the heater is in full action, there will be nothing to fear in forcing the heater, if the connecting pipes are of proper size and clear. These pipes should be occasionally examined to see that they are unobstructed. 143. If in any case the attendant finds the temperature increasing in the heater, so that steam is making, and there is no increase of temperature of the water in the boiler, there will be reason to apprehend that there is some obstruction in the circulation between the heater and the boiler, and the fire should be hauled or allowed to die out in the heater, the fire having at the same time been started in the boiler. As soon as the use of the boiler ceases for the occasion, an examination should be made to ascertain if any and what obstruction there was to the circulation. When heaters are not provided, the above results may be obtained by banking the fires in the fog signal boiler. 144. While the keeper is getting up steam, he must be careful to oil all the working parts of the machinery and by close inspection see that all the oil holes are clear, and that they take oil freely. As often as once a month, as there may be opportunity, the several wearing parts must be taken apart and carefully cleaned and oiled. 145. At all times, while the engine is in operation, see that there is, as near as may be, in the boilers of the locomotive type, two cocks of water, and in upright boilers one and a half cocks. The aim should be never to have less than two cocks of water in the former or one in the latter. 146. Should the water in the boiler foam, prime, and rise at any time while the signal is in operation or while raising steam, shut off for a few moments for the foaming to subside then ascertain the quantity of water left in the boiler, when open again, and increase the quantity of feed water to supply deficiency. If the boiler shows a disposition to foam or prime, the valves should not be opened suddenly, but gradually, or, if necessary to open suddenly for short blasts, it should be closed quickly before the foam can rise to obstruct the flow of steam. In the whistle machines, the opening of the whistle valve is always sudden, and cannot be closed except suddenly and after the full duration of the blast, without changing the characteristics of the signal. 147. Boilers that foam must be pumped up or fed with great care, 
yet observing the safer course of pumping enough, and never allowing the water to get out of sight. If it should occur that from any cause the water should fall below the gauge cocks and glass, do not haul fires, and do not put on the feed or change any valve, nor open the safety valve, but charge the furnace full of the finest coal at hand, so as to completely deaden the fire, leave the fire door open, and close the damper partially. Keep everything in this condition till the boiler cools off, occasionally sprinkling water on the fire, if necessary, to keep it deadened. After the boiler has cooled down, refill the water to the proper height. Examine to ascertain if the pump is out of order, or from what cause the water has fallen too low in the boiler. Clear out the furnace, recharge with kindling, and prepare everything for again lighting fires. 148. The gauge cocks must be kept in good order at all times, and while the machine is in operation, or steam raising for work, they must be frequently tried. They must be kept open, and answer promptly whenever tried. The glass gauge must not be wholly depended upon. 149. The glass gauge must be frequently blown out, to see that all the passages and valves are clear. 150. The safety valve must be kept in good working order at all times, and be frequently examined while the machine is in operation. The safety valve must be taken apart once a month to see that it is in good order and clean, and that it works freely. 151. Regular and continuous pumping is essential to the economical consumption of fuel, which can be easily done by giving a little attention, and by partially closing the cock in the pipe which supplies the pump. But no pipe between the pump and the boiler should be closed at all. A few trials will enable the keeper to determine the proper point at which the supply cock should be closed, which point, when satisfactorily ascertained, must be marked to serve as a guide afterwards. The keeper must not rely upon the fact that the valve is open which supplies the water to the pump, but must frequently examine the glass gauge and try the gauge cocks, as, although the supply valve to the pump is open, the pump may cease working, and the fact not be discovered till the water is too low in the boiler. 152. The furnace door should be kept closed as much as possible, governing the fire mainly by the damper in the chimney. While firing and during work, keep the ash pit door open, but close it when work ceases. 153. The furnace doors of tubular boilers must not be opened wide for cooling down. The sudden admission of cold air will contract the tubes too suddenly and fracture them, causing leaks. But they may be partially opened to aid in cooling down the boiler. 154. The space below the grate bars in the ash pit must be kept free from ashes and cinders, should they be allowed to come in contact with the great bars, they would soon melt. When the engine is at work, the ash pit must be cleaned out at least as often as once a day. The boiler and flues should be brushed clean daily if possible, and although no positive rule can be laid down for periodical cleaning, it must not be forgotten that they are never to be foul. After thirty or thirty-six hours firing, and oftener if the draft is found to be sluggish, the necessity for brushing out the flues to remove ashes and soot will be apparent. When the engine is stopped, clean the boiler and flues, and put everything in order at once for starting the signal again. 155. In case there should be at any time a difference in the indications of the steam pressure gauge and the safety valve, Lose no time in ascertaining the cause, and apply the proper remedy to the defective instrument at once. 156. As the water used in the boilers may be of a different quality at different stations, 
special attention should be given to it. When the water used holds salts in solution, or mud, or sediment in suspension, more frequent blowing off will be necessary than if the water is pure and entirely free from those impurities. Care and good judgment are required in the management of boilers under these circumstances, but above all it is necessary to be very careful to prevent the deposit of mud, lime, salt, or other solid matter in the bottom of the boiler, inasmuch as such deposits endanger both life and property. Deposits of mud will be readily seen by its accumulation about the gauge cocks, and by the spatter from the cocks being foul. 157. The water blow should be opened once in twelve hours, if but for a moment, simply to start the sediment, and longer if the water blows foul. Taking care, however, to shut the valve or cock before the water is too low in the boiler, do not leave the blowcock for an instant while open, but be sure to shut before leaving it. 158. In case sea water is necessarily used continuously, frequent but light blowing off should be resorted to, in preference to occasional exhaustive blowing off, as the latter course necessarily prevents uniformity of work by the engine. If sea water is used, blow off for a short time every two hours, and as often as the boiler is cooled down and opportunity offers. Open the boiler and examine the tubes to see if there has been any scale or deposit made upon them. If so, the amount of water blown off has not been sufficient and must be increased. 159. When fresh water tanks are furnished, from which the boiler can be refilled without the use of a pump, the boiler should be blown out at the end of any protracted fog, but care should be taken to fill the tank before the blowing out. 160. Instructions as to the pressure of steam to be used will be given by the district officers. 161. Great care must be exercised to avoid the effect of freezing weather. Fire must be kept constantly in the heater. All the pump petcocks must be kept open. If the weather is very severe, it will be well to keep low steam, say five to ten pounds, on the main boiler, keeping the temperatures in the engine house, if possible, sufficiently high that a thermometer at the floor will not fall to the freezing point. 162. When the apparatus is to be laid up for the winter, be sure that the water is out of all the pipes. Leave all cocks open. Take off the pump doors and the check valve cap. Empty the tank. 163. In firing with anthracite coal, the bed of fuel should be as thin as can be carried, so that there are no holes for cold air to pass through the fuel. As a rule, the smaller the coal, the thinner the fire. With bituminous coal, the fire must be thicker to avoid air holes through it. Also, if the bituminous coal is binding coal, that is, runs or binds together, it must be occasionally broken or lightened up with the slice bar to keep the fire open. A well-constructed steam boiler is fitted to do its work best when consuming a certain fixed quantity of fuel, coal or wood. Above or below this point there must be more or less waste, and there is as much above it as below it. 164. Haul all fire always before blowing down, and be careful to see that no fire is left under the boiler when blowing down is commenced. Keep the furnace and ash pit doors closed to prevent too sudden cooling of the boiler and the consequent fracture by too sudden contraction of the tubes. 165. See that the cylinder waste cock is open, and all the water in the cylinder, from condensed steam, is removed before starting the engine. As soon as the engine becomes warm, attend to the pump and see that it works well, to prevent any detention on account of a want of a proper quantity of feed water. 
166. When there is no longer necessity for working the engine, open the drip cock of the steam cylinder, and in cold weather open also the cocks in the pipes, to allow all the water to run out of them, to prevent damage by freezing. End of section 5section six of instructions for lightkeepers by the united states lighthouse board this librivox recording is in the public domain the siren one hundred sixty seven the following named parts of this fog signal are shown in plate seven note here follows a list of seventy two parts numbered to match the numbered diagram in plate seven End note. through chamber seven passes shaft fourteen upon one end of which the siren is screwed and held in place by a lock nut on the other end of the shaft is placed a pulley which is rigid and motion is imparted to it by the flywheel of the engine the collars keep the shaft in position after loosing the collars the siren is regulated by bringing it as near as possible to the surface of the chamber but not so near as to impede the movement by means of the set screw of collar eighteen which is rigidly secured to the shaft the siren shaft runs through both bearings and through chamber seven as above described the bearings are provided with lubricators filled partially with cotton which, after being pressed tightly against the shaft, are saturated with oil. Two additional oil cups are provided for the shaft on the casing of the siren. The person in attendance must take special care to see that the shaft is always well supplied with oil. In the shell of chamber seven is a valve which opens and closes the steam ports. That valve is provided at its lower end with teeth, which come into gear with the wheel. This wheel is on shaft 22, and motion is imparted to it by the lever and the pitman rod, which extends to the engine. Lever 25 is raised by means of a weight, and thereby the valve is closed. A flange is provided with a ball-shaped collar, which permits the downward movement of the trumpet and furnishes a steam-tight connection with it. 168. A pulley is on the flywheel shaft. The motion is transmitted from this to another pulley, which is placed on the same shaft with a worm. This worm imparts motion to the worm wheel to which is secured a carrier. This carrier pulls the pitman rod downwards and causes the opening of the valve whenever it comes in contact with a roller placed at the lower end of the pitman rod. The petcock must be opened on starting the engine, and must remain open until there is no water in the cylinder. It must also be opened when the engine is stopped. The aircock must be opened whenever the pump is not required to feed. For the purpose of accelerating the suction of the pump, after it has been idle for some time, the aircock and the watercock are to be opened, and water introduced into the pump through the latter until it reaches the air cock then both cocks must be immediately closed by the safety valve the bursting of the feed pipe is prevented in case the stop cock should be closed the stop cock should always be open and may only be closed in case it should become necessary to inspect the pump valve while the pump is in operation or the water boiler is blown off the blow-off cock is always closed, except when it is necessary to blow off. The cock 67 stops the feed pipe from the hand pumps and is opened when the boiler is to be fed by the latter. 169. The pressure of steam having reached 20 pounds, the engine and siren may be put into operation and continued. 170. The steam pressure should be maintained uniformly as nearly as possible at 70 pounds, 
and never, if it can be avoided, to exceed 80 pounds. 171. In case of disarrangement of the valve gear inside of the standpipe of the siren, take off the handhole plates and see that the defects are remedied, that everything is secure inside, and that the keys and pins are in place. THE STEAM WHISTLE 172. The following parts of this instrument are shown in plate 8. Note. Here follows a list of 48 parts, numbered to correspond with the numbered parts shown in plate 8. End note. 175. During the time of firing up, let the crank of the engine point towards the furnace door. 176. Keep the fuel upon the grate at a uniform height, and never allow it to touch above the linings. 177. The ash pit under the grate must be kept free from ashes and other dirt. 178. Ashes and dirt collected in the jacket around the cylinder should be cleaned out once each week. This can be done through the narrow door or loose plate under the ash pit. 179. The starting is effected by working the flywheel about half round by the starting bar. Watch closely after lighting the fire, and start as soon as the engine will work. The time when it will work can be determined only by attempts to start it. If not started at the proper time, and too much delay takes place, the heater will be destroyed. 180. The engine is stopped by opening the exhaust valve on the top of the cylinder. Keep this valve open until the engine is at rest, and open the furnace door before stopping. 181. While at rest, the furnace door must be kept open, and the wheel turned so as to bring the piston full out. If this is not done as directed, the heater will be destroyed. 182. The cylinder is best greased with a swab dipped in melted tallow. The journals and all joints and bearings must be oiled with good clean oil. Never put oil upon the stem of the exhaust valve. 183. By the damper, combustion may be checked or increased, and the power of the engine governed thereby. 184. A thorough examination, both internal and external, must be made at intervals of two months, so that a correct knowledge of the condition of the motor may be had. 185. When new leather packing is needed for the piston, cut a ring of good stout calf skin, one half inch larger in diameter than the bore of the cylinder. This must be attached to the piston in the same manner as the old one was, with the flesh side of the leather turned outward towards the cylinder. In case the piston is too large, when the packing is new and cannot readily be put in the cylinder, make a very light fire in the cylinder, so that it may be expanded, but use great care and do not get it so hot as to burn the leather. 186. The stuffing box through which the piston rod works should be screwed moderately tight only. Lamp wick or any other elastic material will answer for packing. 187. The reed or tongue is the most delicate part of the trumpet. The trumpet needs only to be kept clean and free. Any fracture which may occur from excessive vibration may be repaired with hard solder by the visiting mechanic. 188. The tongue or reed should be fitted so as to get a satisfactory tone. If too flat, make the point thinner. If too sharp, make the back end thinner. By trial, the best results can be soon obtained. Also, try different reeds of different pressures, 
and use that pressure which gives the best tone with each particular reed. Duplicate reeds should be furnished at all times when needed by application to the proper authorities, and the station should never be without two or more in store. Stevens Fog Bell Striking Apparatus 189. The following named parts are shown in Plate 10. Note. Here follows a list of 32 parts, numbered to correspond with the labeled parts in Plate 10. End note. 190. Keep the machine clean and free from dirt and rust in all its parts. This can only be done by constant care and attention, in wiping with waste or cloths which are slightly saturated with oil. Care must be taken not to use so much oil that passing particles of dirt will adhere to the surface. Care must always be taken to keep the machine as dry as possible, by stopping closely the opening in the side of the room or ceiling through which the connection between the hammer and the machine passes, so as to prevent rain or spray from passing in and wetting the machinery. 191. Before starting the engine, be sure that the machinery and the hammer are well oiled in all bearings and points of contact where friction exists by one surface moving upon another, with some pure lubricating oil. Upon the clockwork, which regulates the intervals between strokes, a fine oil such as is used upon clocks would be preferable. Avoid putting on too much oil, for by that means the machinery and surroundings will become filthy and catch and retain all flying particles which come in contact with it. Yet be sure that enough oil is always on so that the parts may not run dry and cut. Never leave this machine alone while running. Some competent person must be in constant attendance upon it to rectify any irregularity and prevent accidents which might occur. 192. Always remove the winding crank as soon as the machine is wound up, and see that no obstruction is in the way of the weight, whereby it might be prevented from acting equally at all times upon the machine. 193. Be sure that the hammer and the rod connecting it with the machine does not come in contact with any of its surroundings during the operation of striking. 194. If any part or parts of the machine are to be removed for cleaning or repairs, be sure always to run down or support the driving weight of the machine. Never disconnect any part of the machine until this weight is secured, so that it will not operate it. 195. Never let the wire rope which supports the weight which actuates the machine rub or chafe against any surrounding parts. In case the clockwork has not enough power to throw off the falling lever or cam which liberates the striking weight, move the brass weight which actuates the clockwork further from the center and toward the end of the lever. This will increase the power, and moving the weight toward the center will diminish the power. If the falling lever operated by the pins falls, but does not have the power to liberate the striking levers, the power may be increased by moving the brass weight toward the outer end of the lever, and if the weight is too great, move the weight toward the center or fulcrum of the lever. Before making any alterations in the machine, it would be well to examine it thoroughly, and see if the difficulty does not arise from some cause independent of the machinery. Do not use any more weight to drive the machine than will give a good sharp blow, or give the best result in tone and the loudest sound from the bell struck. The sections of the weight furnished weigh 100 pounds each, except the section which has the hook attached, which is heavier. 300 pounds will strike a sharp blow, and 400 pounds a very hard blow. Proportion the weight and blow to the size of the bell to be struck. Anderson's Hand Fog Signal 
196. This instrument should be kept clean in all of its parts. Avoid bruising or indenting the cylinders. Should such accident occur, introduce a round piece of smooth wood as large in diameter as the cylinder will admit, and with a small round hard stick rub and press the indented part until restored to its original form as near as possible. Avoid drawing the metal, which would permanently injure the instrument. Use great care to keep sand and all similar substances out of the instrument. 197. As long as the instrument gives good tone, do not meddle with the tongue or reed in any other way than to wipe and keep it clean. Observe when the instrument is in good order the position of the reed, relative to the reed seat. Then, should accident occur to the reed, put it in the same relative position as it was originally, and try the tone of the instrument. This need only be done when no duplicate reeds are in store. When duplicates are at hand, replace the injured one with a new one, and preserve the injured one that it may be repaired. 198. The packing upon the lower end of the piston cylinder can be renewed when worn with lamp wick or other similar material, which material should be filled with clean tallow when applied to the piston. End of section 6. Section 7 of Instructions to Lightkeepers by the United States Lighthouse Board. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Instructions for Painting 199. The whole interior of the lighthouse lanterns, dome, astragals, ventilators, smoke conductor, etc., is to be painted white, and must be kept clean, free from soot and grease, and the white paint renewed as often as necessary. The paint may be kept clean and free from soot and grease by occasional scrubbing and washing with clear, soft, hot water and soap, followed by clean water. If from bad ventilation, neglect, or any other cause, the interior of the dome, the astragals, etc., have become very dirty, and the soot and grease cannot be removed by scrubbing with hot water and soap, then the lye of wood ashes, oak or hickory, will remove it. In case lye cannot be had, then it may be washed with strong lime water, which will answer nearly as well as strong lye. Lye is not, however, to be used in cleaning woodwork, for painting or repainting. In painting outside work, the color must not be changed from that previously existing. See paragraph 63 of the Regulations of the Lighthouse Board. 200. Paint will not adhere to and dry upon wood or metal which is not perfectly clean and entirely free from soot and grease. Soot must be removed by brushes and cloths or towels, and by washing with hot water and soap. Oil and other grease on woodwork must be removed by the use of spirits of turpentine and a worn or other stiff brush, rubbing the part vigorously until the stains are removed. When the above means have been resorted to without entire success, mix a thin whitewash, strain it, and give the parts to be painted a coat of it with a paintbrush. When this whitewash becomes thoroughly dry, take a clean brush and with it remove all the whitewash, and the parts thus treated will be in the proper condition for receiving the paint. Iron, brass, copper, etc., must be cleaned so as to present a smooth surface. All blistered and cracked paint and all rust on iron must be carefully removed, and the parts smoothed before putting on the paint. 201. A mixture prepared by the following recipe will remove paint from old iron. Dissolve two pounds of potash in a bucket of water. Add about one and a half pounds of slacked lime and stir it well. With a mop, apply this mixture to the paint 
and after a few minutes it may be easily removed by scraping. As rapidly as the old paint is scraped off, rinse the iron with fresh water and dry it. This will leave the iron clean and bright. 202. Take the necessary quantity of paint from the keg and mix spirits of turpentine with it until it is of the consistency of cream. Then put in patent drying or Japan varnish in the proportion of one gill for each gallon of paint and mix the paint, turpentine, and drying well together. The paint will then be ready for immediate use. When the paint in the bucket becomes thicker than cream, it must be thinned by adding small quantities of spirits of turpentine, and it may be necessary to add also a very small quantity of boiled linseed oil at the same time to increase its drying qualities. Black paint for inside work will be greatly improved by mixing it with spirits of turpentine and copal or coachmaker's varnish. The varnish will give the paint when dry a gloss. Black paint for inside work may be prepared with dry lamp black, mixed with copal or coachmaker's varnish, and then thinned to the consistency of cream with spirits of turpentine. One pound of fine lamp black will require about half a gallon of varnish to prepare it to receive the spirits of turpentine. No oil is to be mixed with paint which has been ground in oil in preparing paint for inside work. Red lead is put up dry. Quantities required for immediate use only are to be mixed. If not used immediately after being mixed, it becomes hard and unfit for any use. 203. Paints for outside work are to be mixed with boiled linseed oil and the necessary quantity of patent drying or Japan varnish. Black paint for outside work may be mixed with boiled linseed oil and copal or coachmaker's varnish. No spirits of turpentine is to be used in mixing paints for outside work. Iron work, which has been neglected and rusty, should be thoroughly cleaned by scraping and polishing, and then primed with one or two coats of red lead before the paint of the required color is put on. Raw linseed oil is, as a general rule, only used for priming new woodwork. 204. For gray or lead color, add lamp black or black paint ground in oil in small quantities to white paint ground in oil until the desired shade is obtained. For yellow paint, chrome yellow and yellow ochre are in general use. For straw color or buff, to chrome yellow or yellow ochre, add, in small quantities at a time, white paint ground in oil until the desired shade is obtained, to which a small quantity of Venetian red may be added to soften the yellow gloss. For brick color, mix yellow paint, red lead, and a small quantity of white paint. Oak wood color may be made with three-fourths of white paint and one-fourth of umber and yellow ochre. The proportions of umber and yellow ochre will be determined by the desired tint. Portland stone color is made with umber, yellow, and white paint. In mixing all paints, it must be remembered that the quantity of drying is to be in the same proportion, and that for inside work, or work not exposed to the weather, spirits of turpentine is to be used for thinning, and for outside work, exposed to the weather, oil is to be used without turpentine. The following materials may be mixed with the paints as dryers. Patent drying paste, Japan varnish liquid, litharge in powder. When litharge is used as a dryer, it must be reduced to a fine powder, then by means of a little oil made into a paste, and finally mixed thoroughly with the paint before using it. 205. Paint brushes are round and flat and of different sizes. Round brushes vary from one to two and a half inches in diameter. The large paint brushes are used for putting on priming and in painting over large surfaces 
which require considerable quantities of color. The small brushes are used for parts to which the large brushes from their size cannot be applied. Flat brushes are used for sashes, for varnishing, and for painting in lines or narrow spaces. When the bristles of a brush get loose, drive a few thin wedges of wood inside of the binding twine or thread, which will render the whole fast again. A different brush should be used for each color. Brushes which have been used must not be left to dry with the paint in them. They should be put into a paint pot or an old paint keg with sufficient water to come within half an inch of the binding of the brush. Care must be taken not to have too much water in the paint pot or keg, for if the binding of the brush is left in the water it will soon rot and the brush will be useless. When short of brushes, they may be washed in oil or spirits of turpentine, and finally with soap and water, so as to render them fit for use in any color. The oil and spirits of turpentine used in washing brushes will do for mixing paint of the same color of the paint washed from the brushes. 206. Paints of all descriptions must be put up in the best manner and kept in a dry place. Dryings, varnishings, etc. must be kept in bottles or tins. When a part of the paint is taken from a keg, ground in oil, the residue is to be covered with water to the depth of one or two inches at least, and then the head of the keg is to be put in tightly. The paint must not be left to dry nor exposed to the air or weather. Putty must be put up and kept in bladders under cover and not exposed either to the sun or weather. When too hard for use, it may be softened by mashing and rolling in the hands, aided by the addition of a little linseed oil. To make putty, to four-fifths of pulverized Spanish whiting, add one-fifth linseed oil and work it into a paste. 207. In painting, durability is to be the first consideration. The parts to be painted must be clean, smooth, and free from grease. All holes, cracks, nail heads, etc., must be filled in with putty. If the wood is new, the first coat should be put on thin to serve as a priming. If new iron, then a thin coat or two of red paint should be put on as a priming. A second coat of paint is never to be put on until the previous one is thoroughly dry and hard which will never be the case while the least stickiness is felt on applying the hand to it. Each coat should be of the same thickness throughout, otherwise the work when done will have an unfinished and slovenly appearance. Paint put on too thin after priming will crack in drying. If put on too thick, it will blister, wrinkle, and peel off. In using the brush, where there is sufficient space, long strokes should be employed to extend the color in a smooth and uniform manner. Where the space is contracted or rough, the paint should be laid on in dabs for the purpose of getting it into the recesses and places where the surface is unequal. Sash brushes and pencils should not be dipped into the paint pots, but a small quantity of the paint should be placed upon a clean board, a piece of tin or glass, to serve as a palette, the brush or pencil can then be worked into the paint and fine lines drawn with it, but if dipped into the paint pot, the exterior of the brush only will be covered with paint, with which it will not be possible to do nice work. Recipes Whitewash 208. The following recipe for whitewashing has been found by experience to answer on wood, brick, and stone nearly as well as oil paint, and is much cheaper. Slake half a bushel of unslaked lime with boiling water, keeping it covered during the process. Strain it and add a peck of salt dissolved in warm water, three pounds of ground rice put in boiling water and dissolved to a thin paste, half a pound of powdered Spanish whiting, and a pound of clear glue dissolved in warm water. Mix these well together and let the mixture stand for several days. Keep the wash thus prepared in a kettle or portable furnace, and when used, put it on as hot as possible with painters or whitewash brushes. 
Cement washing the outside of lighthouse towers. 209. Take of fresh Rosendale cement three parts, clean sand one part, and mix them thoroughly with fresh water. This will give a gray or granite color, dark or light, according to the color of the cement. If a brick color is desired, add enough Venetian red to the mixture to produce that color. The cement, sand, and coloring matter must be mixed together. If white is desired, the walls, when new, should receive two coats of cement wash and then whitewash. After the work has received the first coat, a single coat every three or four years will be sufficient. It is best to thoroughly dampen the wall with clean fresh water and follow immediately after with the cement wash. This course will prevent the bricks from absorbing the water from the wash too quickly and will give time for the cement to set. Care must be taken to keep all the ingredients of the cement wash well stirred during the application of it. The mixture must be made as thick as it will admit of to be conveniently put on with a whitewash brush. To purify rainwater at lighthouse stations. 210. Water contaminated with chloride of lead from salt spray resting on the leads of lighthouses, etc., whence rainwater is collected, does not lose its poisonous qualities either by boiling or by exposure to the air. To purify this water and render it perfectly fit for all culinary and domestic purposes, it will only be necessary to put some powdered chalk or whiting into each cistern in which such rain water is collected and to stir it up well occasionally after rain has fallen. Allowances of Provisions 211. At certain unusually isolated light stations, an allowance of provisions is granted by the special authority of the lighthouse board in each case. A similar allowance, but necessarily greater in amount, is granted to the master and crew of light vessels. The articles are furnished in accordance with the following tables of allowances. Table of quarterly allowance per man for vessels of the lighthouse establishment. Pork, 45 pounds beef 45 pounds, flour 20 pounds, rice 10 pounds, raisins 6.5 pounds, ship biscuit 65 pounds, brown sugar 14 pounds, tea 1 and 3 eighths pounds, coffee 6 pounds, butter 3 and a quarter pounds, beans or peas 2 and a quarter gallons, vinegar three quarters of a gallon, molasses, three quarters of a gallon, pickles, six pounds, potatoes, two and a half bushels, onions, one bushel. Table of annual allowance per man for light stations and fog signal stations. Pork, 200 pounds, beef, 100 pounds, flour, two barrels, rice, 50 pounds, brown sugar, 50 pounds, coffee, green grain, 24 pounds, beans or peas, 10 gallons, vinegar, 4 gallons, potatoes, 2 barrels. Addendum. At its meeting of December 3, 1883, the Lighthouse Board amended paragraph 211 of the Instructions to Lightkeepers, so as to read as follows. Table of weekly allowance per man for vessels of the lighthouse establishment. Beef, corned, two pounds. Beef, preserved, one and a half pounds. Pork, two pounds. Codfish, two pounds. Flour, four pounds. Pilot bread, two and a half pounds. Rice, a half pound. Beans, one and a half pints. Potatoes, twelve pounds onions, two pounds, sugar, two pounds, molasses, a half pint, coffee, seven ounces, tea, one and three quarter ounces, butter, eight ounces, vinegar, a half pint, pickles, a half pound, 
tomatoes, 12 ounces, dried apples, 4 ounces. Table of annual allowance per man for light stations and fog signal stations. Beef, 200 pounds, pork, 100 pounds, flour, 1 barrel, rice, 25 pounds, beans, 10 gallons, potatoes, 4 bushels, onions, 1 bushel, sugar, 50 pounds, coffee, 24 pounds, vinegar, 4 gallons. At the request of the master of the vessel or keeper of the light station, these quantities may be changed, some being increased and others diminished, provided the total cost of the ration is not thereby made greater. Note. The next page of the book contains a table of the keeper's salaries, indicating when salary payments are due and in what amounts. Then follow 11 pages of detailed index, enabling a light keeper to look up any piece of needed information according to either its section number or its page number. Finally, the book contains 13 detailed plates diagramming all of the machinery referred to in the course of the book, with all of the parts labeled. The salary table, index, and descriptions of these diagrams is omitted from this recording. End note. End of Section 7 End of Instructions to Light Keepers by the United States Lighthouse Board Recording by Maria Casper